Uh, up first, we have Karen Robinson, who's an entrepreneur, a producer, a director from Golden Thrones Productions in Virginia Beach. And uh, she'll be co-moderated by Jade Voigt, Miss Virginia USA 2015. And uh, who's our special guest speaker? So I would like to introduce our first panel of the night. We have Matthew Penn, producer and director of over 200 primetime hour dramas. Penn has worked for virtually every network and significant cable channel. His most notable credits are Orange is the New Black, Law and Order, The Sopranos, most recently Queen of the South, and upcoming series The Myth. Everyone give it up for Matthew Penn. All right, it is good to have everybody here. Matthew, you especially. I uh, actually grew up watching Law and Order, so. <laughs> you know, thank goodness you did. I have kids to put through college. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, when I read your bio, I was just like, what an honor. Such a good, thrilling, storytelling show. It was just great. House especially. So I just, um, yeah, I'm just really excited about that. Um, we have a couple questions. You know, we're both in production, behind the scenes, and so we just really wanted to know what drove you to get into producing and filming. What was that um, factor that got you into it from the get-go? You know something, one of the things that I, uh, I I'm going to stand up actually, okay. you mind? One of the things that um, I enjoyed was telling stories about people, and uh, I was working in the theater. I was working in the theater in New York uh, uh, as an actor and then as a director. And uh, it was the telling of a human story which is what got me into film and television and theater in the first place. Um, and I won't bore you with the whole journey from acting on stage to directing on stage to finally getting into television. It was a long journey and, and a hard one. Uh, uh, but, but, but good and valuable and what I cared about was as I say telling stories about people I mean I want you to sit there watch your TV and go that meant something to me or that spoke to me or that meant something to the person I'm with or and that if you can tell a story like that that has a kind of resonance that's everything so that's what got me in wow amazing Beautiful. One of our next questions is for aspiring directors and producers. Um, how do you get the attention of a rep or studio uh, as a first-time director or producer? Uh, okay, well, that's <laughs> that's a long that's a long answer. But uh, how many directors do we have out here? Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, here's here is I'm going to tell you a story just by way of uh, the anecdote is the best way I know how to describe it. So. I got a call from a friend of mine who teaches at a sort of a esteemed theater program and he said you got to meet this young woman she was a student of mine and she's done extraordinary work and she put together a web series and you have to meet her and so we tried to find time you know this was a dear friend so we tried to I said okay we tried to find time to have a cup of coffee or lunch we finally found time and the night before uh, she had sent me her information, kind of her, but she was really two years out of college. And what she'd done, she'd come to New York, she came to New York, and she got a job waitressing. And she put away every dollar she could put away. She got about eight or nine thousand dollars together, and she shot a web series. And uh, she did, I think, eight episodes of a series called The Bar. And uh, I watched it the night before I met her for lunch. And it was terrific. And so I went in and I said, what inspired you? She said, you know what? I came to New York to direct and to act. Uh, I wrote this with a dear friend of mine whose work as a writer I appreciate. And uh, I put it together. I got crew together and I paid everybody just the smallest possible that I could. But everybody worked. I got a DP who wanted to do it, and she did it. And that's my advice. <laughs> and I don't mean to say go make a web series necessarily, but I do mean to say go do it. Mm -hmm. Direct a reading in a friend's loft. Go find a theater that has 20 seats. Uh, make a web series. Uh, you know, 
you can rent a camera these days for not that much money. And you can go out and you can tell a story. If you don't write, find a writer who does. If you're not a DP, find a DP who wants to shoot something with you. Believe me, they're out there. So uh, it's like that old Nike thing. Just do it. That's what you have to do. Now, I'm not kidding you. It sounds like a glib answer. If you sit there and say, I'm waiting to be hired as a director, you will wait the rest of your life. You will. No one's going to say, Steven Spielberg or so-and-so. The other people will always get the job. So go do it. OK. Those are amazing words of advice, especially for some of us. And that kind of brings me back to your first point where you talked about how it was a little bit of a tough journey getting to where you were. Is there any moment that you can pinpoint where you were just kind of like, I give up. I can't right now. I can't do this. Did you ever have that kind of doubt, that kind of moment? And how did you overcome it? No, never. <laughs> no, I'm kidding you a, a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, so if you think about the fact that you want to tell stories that have some kind of meaning, some kind of resonance, some kind of importance. So I came to New York. I'd worked a, a little bit in film production. Came to New York and I began to act. And I acted anywhere and everywhere I could. I did theater. I did film. I did some television. And I worked as an actor. And the best thing I can say is that, you know, I was always supporting myself as an actor. Uh, and I was doing that for about seven or eight years. But during the end of that time, uh, I was doing a play. And the director of the other play left because he got a bigger job. And they said, well, who can do this play? We're stuck. We're in a week away from I said, I think I can. So I directed that play. And that led to something else at a little bigger place and something else and then something else. And then I was directing a, the marathon at Ensemble Studio Theater where you get paid, you know, $20, but it's a great theater. If you haven't been there, go find out what new young writers are doing. That's a place. So uh, I was directing there, and somebody at ABC saw a piece of work that I'd done, and um, they brought me in the next day to interview for doing a, a daytime drama, a soap. I'd never thought of that. I never thought of it. But uh, I was married, and we had a young son on the way, and uh, uh, so I said, well, how much does it pay? <laughs> and they said, well, it pays. And I thought, wow, that's like more than I've made the last 10 theater pieces. Wow. Uh, so I did that. I signed a contract. But I knew very quickly that that was not, um, that daytime was not sort of going to be my focus. Um, and at Law and & Order, and I won't, it's a whole long roundabout way to describe how I met the guy that was running Law & Order. But it had to do with work I was doing in film production. Anyway, I met him, and I persisted. And one of the things that interested him the most was that I'd worked in the theater, that I'd worked with actors. He could have cared less about daytime. He did not care. But he cared about knowing how to talk to actors. So there's that experience where I was getting paid two cents, now coming in handy with one of the big jobs that you can imagine. So. Uh, they finally gave me a shot at Law & Order. It was Sam Waterston's first season. And uh, Law & Order then became a significant, not an exclusive, but a significant part of my life over the next 10 or 12 years. I produced the show as well. Um, and I was fortunate, as, the, as the, uh, the credits indicate, to work in a lot of other places during that time. Uh, but from the time I got out of college to the time I said action, the first time on a television, a big time television set, it's probably 12 years. So not overnight. It was a long, long, long journey. But it was something I always wanted to do. So there were plenty of times where I could have said, no, I'm not doing it. But uh, my wife will tell you, every day, uh, now I've been doing this for whatever, 30 years, every day I get up and I work. And I work on work, whether that's reading three more scripts or setting up a meeting or whether I'm shooting something or editing something. But every day I work on work. Every day. I, I treat it like 
that's part of the job because it is part of the job. If you get up and you're watching TV, that's not, you're not going to work. So. Well, that was perfect. Thank you. That's too long. Very inspiring. I think all the actors and producers and directors in the room can relate to that, to just keep persevering through all of our struggles. Um, the next question that we do have is what makes a successful production versus a non-successful produ production in your book? Uh, well, I'll tell you that, that, that the single best um, element that a television show can have is one vision. And I'll give you an example of a few shows. The Sopranos had one vision, David Chase. Law and Order had one vision in Dick Wolf. NYPD Blue had one vision in David Milch and Stephen Bochco. Uh, Damages with Glenn Close had one vision. Those are all shows I had the real privilege and honor to work on a lot. And uh, in network television, you guys don't have to worry about this yet necessarily. But you know, by the time a creator of a show sees it on the air, they've been inundated with so many notes, so much input, so much that it, um, it can be overwhelming. And pretty soon, the story that started as a horse has now become a donkey. And that's not any way to tell a story with any kind of integrity. So I will tell you that all of those shows I just mentioned, which, were, which are among uh, real legendary shows, uh, had one vision. And that's a struggle. That's not easy. It's not a failure of other shows that they're not able to retain that. I've worked on many terrific shows that had you know, different degrees of, uh, uh, of success in that arena. But if you really want to say what's the one thing, that's it. Well, we were really um, excited to ask this one. What's it like working in various locations? It's great. I mean, uh, you know, television is done. I mean, sometimes it's hard to be away from home, particularly when our kids were little. Um, but uh, television now is done everywhere. It's done in New York and Los Angeles, but also Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Vancouver. You're now seeing, uh, we were watching Night Manager, and they were shooting in Mallorca. They were shooting in the Alps. Um, you know, the bar in television has gotten higher and higher, and thanks to so many of you, when I was young, television always took a backseat to films. Now you're really getting almost kind of two films. You're getting the big blockbusters, and you're getting, sometimes you're going to get a little independent that can be very good. Those, frankly, are some of the best films. But television has now filled this huge, huge uh, appetite um, in which I don't know how many shows there are, 400, something like that, 400 series. You can't possibly keep up. But you can find pretty much something for everybody. I think... Um, one of the folks from Stranger Things is on the panel later tonight. You know, there are many, 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 many great shows. And television has had this, um, I, I, I would say, renaissance, but it's, it goes beyond that. It's hardly a rebirth. It's a birth like no one's ever seen before. And that's pretty extraordinary. So it's done in many locations. When you're directing, uh, uh, I was on a show, Queen of the South, where I was producing that, so we had to be in Dallas for a long time. I wouldn't recommend Dallas for a long time, <laughs> unless somebody's from Dallas, and then I, re and then I retract that. But, um, but when, you're, when you're freelance directing, you're going into a city for three weeks. Like I was just in Halifax to do The Mist. And it's fun. You get a feel for the place. If you're shooting and it's on location a lot, that's always great to be able to take advantage of what does that city look like? Chicago is fantastic to shoot in, as long as it's not January or February. <laughs> but it's, um, it's, uh, that's always an interesting challenge. Yeah. Great. Well, I think we're going to open up the floor to some Q&As. Does anyone have any questions? How do you, how do you determine which project you want to, like, what's your determining factor? The mortgage. <laughs> I mean, we all have to earn a living, so, so there's that. But um, like all of you, I, I go, I say, what 
interests me? What do I think is unusual? You know, I saw damages uh, the first season and they approached me and I just hadn't had a chance to see it. And I sat down and I thought, this is great. This is great. And it had a vision, it was distinct, it was unusual. Uh, and I thought, I want to pursue that. I, I want to do that. So uh, you're finally measured by the things in a weird way that you do, uh, that you say yes to, or that you generate. And uh, uh, I followed a path of what, what interests me to work on. Doesn't mean I've loved everything I've done. Sometimes I have been paying the rent. But, uh, but never, even on a show where I thought, okay, for whatever reason, I got to say yes to this. Every day I find something human I want to tell, some part of that story that matters to me, something with an actor that I care about. That's what makes me get up in the morning and want to go to work. That collaboration with actors or DPs or crew or writers. Uh, so even, even on a series where maybe I'm not, gangbusters to do it, find something human. Find something you want to say. And believe it or not, it'll get better, both for you and for everybody else. How do you collaborate with actors on TV, knowing that TV is so fast? What are the ways that actors can, especially if you're directing, what are the ways that actors can go to you with an idea or suggestions we're seeing without stepping on any toes or wasting time. Well, you have two groups of actors. You have the series regulars, uh, you know, who are there every episode, the whole journey. Now, they know those characters pretty darn well. So you have to get a sense from them about are they open to hearing input? Uh, most of them are. Most of them want the feedback. Uh, and then you have actors that are hired to do that particular episode or just a handful of episodes. And uh, when that's the case, uh, you're helping create the, the uh, characters with them. And uh, those folks, those actors, tend to be very responsive because they want to please, they want to please you. They also want to find what's the vision that you have, that the writers have. So uh, my experience is almost all actors want to hear feedback. They want to hear, that was good, or let's try to make it better by doing this, or series regulars, like I said, they've already invented the wheel. They, they know what they're doing. And so then it's a question of refinement and clarity. With, a, with an actor that's guest starring, that's really a question of collaboration together fully as creating this person, whether you're playing the character of the bus driver or the governor. You know? I think that might have been the last question. It. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but Matthew, wow, somebody's double part. thank you so much for coming out. Everybody give it one more time for Matthew Penn. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jake.